Good evening. My name is Jeff Grunfeld of the Speakers Program. Our guest tonight, Mr. Fuller, is described as an architect. He is that because of his intense concern with living space. But he is something more than an architect because his obsession is with the architecture of the universe. We have all heard of Mr. Fuller's inventions, the geodesic dome, the Dymaxion car, the Wichita house, the world map, and other ideas. All demonstrate a brilliant use of space and material. But what is far more important is that Mr. Fuller has shown how to get the maximum from the minimum material by making the most intelligent use of the resources available on Earth. Would you welcome, please, a very warm, concerned, and sensitive human being, Dr. Buckminster Fuller. The first thing I have to do is to, uh, to, uh, well, I, I thank you very much for being thoughtful, is to be sure that you understand uh, what, what I think about myself, <laughs> because I'm absolutely confident, having been living with myself now for 77 years, that I am, uh, that there's nothing that I have been able to do there's nothing that I have that everybody else doesn't have and could do. <laughs> that society has, as I, I found society, <laughs> world society, preoccupied in ways that, in a sense, were historically logical, evolutionarily logical, but luckily I was really able to, to break out of the pattern. <laughs> and I became interested in really, I was just to make it very simple, the, uh, I found all my contemporaries when I was young, absolutely convinced that number one priority is how do you earn a living? And that's what it seemed, seemed to be logical to society. There really was a great struggle. At the time that I, when I was young, really a very, very small percentage of humanity were even mildly economically successful, less than 1%. And really was, was, a, was, a, was a scary struggle. And the people then were preoccupied with that as a, as a high priority, high priority couldn't be more logical. But what I felt was that, that all of these human beings had beautiful minds, capability, and what I thought we really ought to be doing was saying, what does my experience teach me needs to be done that nobody's attending to? <laughs> I found there was enormous competition to get any one of the jobs, rather than trying to see what other things need to be attended to and not being attended to. What things do, does your experience tell you need to be attended to, which if not attended to, society is going to be at a very great disadvantage, and which if attended to, society will be advantaged. That's fairly simple. And I re realized each person's experience is a little different, and certain people could see that this was a log in the road and somebody's going to be killed if, it's, if that comes on this thing at night and at high speed. So it's up to you to remove it, get it out of the way. At any rate, obviously, if you began to do that, there would be no way in which anybody would agree to pay you to do what you're doing. <laughs> I, at the time I made the decision, I had, I, I knew, I laid it, our child was, had just been born. My, this, this was a second child. Five years earlier, our first child had died after a really great battle of four years. She'd been born in time of World War I and, and caught spinal meningitis and infantile paralysis and, and we struggled hoping that she could, we could get through this and she died just before her fourth birthday, which was, you can imagine the, 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 the pain and loss, but suddenly to have this new life entrusted with this new life, which seemed to be absolutely healthy, it was a very, really caused you to really, really pause. At that time, I was 32 years of age. My father died when I was very young. These are circumstances anybody could have. At any rate, the way the pattern worked out with my father dying when I was very young, and he had a number of friends who loved him, and they, was, he, they would say to my mother, we'd like to help you with your boy. And my mother would say, <clears throat> now, now, listen to this man, he's taking a lot of trouble to talk to you, and he knows what he's talking about. 
and I, I would say, I don't, I don't feel, it just doesn't seem logical to me, or whatever it is. My mother said, never mind what you think, really take, pay attention, because this man is really, does know what he's talking about. And I knew that my mother made quite a sacrifice to send me to school, she had to pay to go to, and she was sure they knew what they were talking about. And so she was continually, I was continually being counseled by society to listen to the other, other person, they were experts. And nobody was interested in what I was thinking. I really learned then to say, well, my thoughts don't agree with what I'm learning, but I guess I'm just a freak, and I guess I have to live with a freak. But uh, uh, it was at 32, I had then really learned to completely suppress my own ways of thinking and to learn how the games are played. And I'd been counseled by several, and, and, and I got on, there were collision courses, they weren't, they weren't really well thought through. And because I, some things I was very idealistic about and so forth and, and hoped things would work out. And I really, at the time this new child was born and I was bus, absolutely broke and, and uh, lost credit, most of the people that th thought well of me because I had gone into a venture which uh, uh, did not make money. And so the people lost their money and I think they felt I was very, very much of a, of a, of a failure. So that at this point with this new life, the challenge of it, I really had to, to uh, I said, Here, here's, here's this beautiful new life, trust us, and, and maybe I'm just really a mess, <laughs> and maybe I better get me out of the way. And my mother, who, who's not well off, and my wife's family not particularly well off, they might find out to get on better than the way I've been doing, I'm just really making a mess. I either, I've either got to get myself out of the way or really do my own thinking and really commit myself in a quite a different manner. And really one of the first thoughts came to me was that if I were able then to stay on and look out for this daughter, I didn't think she'd be very happy if she grew up and found that I had committed myself to trying to get special advantage for her in a world where there was an enormous amount of, of great poverty and, and want. That I thought she if she'd be the kind of child I hoped she could be. <laughs> and I really dreamt that she could be, that all human beings really can be great, that uh, she would be much happier when she grew up. She found I'd really commend myself to try to, to work for all of humanity in such a way that it might be even mild, mild, minorly effective, that possibly things are a little better for everybody. And she tells me, she's now grown, she's a professor here at the university, and she tells me she, she really is very happy with the decision I did make. Anyway, if I'm going to do my own thinking, this meant then there are all kinds of things I've been taught to believe. <laughs> and if you, I don't know how much you get, you, I'm sure you get exposed to all kinds of things you're, you're, it's suggested to you by older people, but this is what you've got to believe. And right, I had had many of those, so I said, I'm going to have to really do everything I can to uncondition myself from anything I've learned to believe and go entirely on what I've learned <laughs> by experience. And my thinking base must be uh, always experience. If it is part of my experience that people that I know well, I've had experiences with them, many experiences with them, and I find that they're very faithful in reporting what it is we're, we're experiencing, I would then be able to, it might be my experience, that there are things they tell me about that I'm not present are probably reliable. Not where they say, there is a theory which you've got to believe. They're telling me about some, some events, and they probably would be as good as my observation of those events, possibly better. When scientists then report something they found out experimentally, I could accredit that. <laughs> so, but it, not what the theory of the scientists, but what they found out. So I really had quite a large experience bank in addition to my own to go on. And one of the things I, I said, that, all right, now you were brought up, there's this grandmother, you know how much she loves you, she, she, there was no question about that. But how she had told me, you are, you are young, you're only a few years old, and, and I'm older than you, and, and there's something I feel that I ought to, to get you to understand. And, and she asked me to believe various things about events that went on in the eastern end of the Mediterranean world 2,000 years ago. And because she, I know how much she loved me, so well, I, I accredited the, 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 this is a legend, this way it goes, it's fine. At any rate, it meant then giving up all the religious conditioning I'd had. And I said, all right, on that score, 
what, what, if anything, has your experiences taught you regarding whether there might be a greater intellect operating in our universe than that of man? I said, I'm, I'm all overwhelmed by the, what seems to be a very much greater knowledge operating. Man just discovered some things, but he had to discover them. But the, the integrities that, it, that he's discovered were, were already operative. They were a priori. And there are a great many of them, they're all interaccommodative. They, they seem, they clearly are intellectual accommodation. They can only be discovered intellectually. <laughs> they, so that I said, I, I'm, all, I'm really all found by on my experience, but something, some greater competence operating in the universe than that of man, I, I think I was, that, that was one of the things I'm very greatly committed to. Now, going from there, I also was said, if you're going to do your own thinking, I want you to understand some of the, the some of the, why I did some of the things I did. And I said, uh, here I, I'm giving up this idea of how to earn a living and I'm just going to think and there's no, no way in which you're going to be paid for that and how is the family going to get on? I said, well, one of the things that, that very powerfully manifests to me is the there is any great design. Here it was ecologically. <coughs> here, here are all the trees giving off all the gases necessary to keep all the mammals going, and all the mammals giving off the gases necessary to keep the trees going. <laughs> that I saw the big design things going on where the individual participants were really unconscious of what, how the thing was working out. <laughs> I saw that nature really did manifest in all kinds of inter-accommodations, and I said, Th th this is design. <laughs> now, inasmuch as, as the design then involves biological controls, and we have the genetic drives where the design of the various biological phenomena, as you and I know today a little more about it, uh, the DNA, RNA design controls, but the behavioral controls seem to be genetic. and and. The genetics were just in, in their, their dawning at the time I'm doing this thinking, which is about 46 years ago. And so I said, I think that uh, there is then um, each one of the living creatures is given a drive and it goes, follows that drive, but, but they, they are, each of the drives are in view of, the, uh, of a very much greater evolutionary problem to be solved. And it could be that you could understand a little more in principle. Now, I'm going to um, give you, here, 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 is, here is the thing. I said that it could be that if these things that do need to be done, that I can see need to be done, that I've been given that kind of capability, if I attend to them, it could be then that they are part of, the, of this bigger design and that if I attend to them, I'll find that, that, that we survive all right but it won't be by a direct bargaining regarding that particular act. There are a number of things you need to do and you'll find out in due course whether if what you're doing is what you should be doing by which you, that you'll find yourself surviving <laughs> by what will seem to be pure accident, pure, 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 absolute pure accident. No, no direct connection whatsoever. And you'll, you'll, you'll learn. Anyway, I said, I think that could, there really may be such a law operating in our universe that man is not familiar with. I think it's really worth experimenting to find out whether it is. Otherwise, I want to understand that <coughs> during what I was doing, I was not really doing all blind idealism at all. I was trying to, I've I, I become really very deeply impressed with, with laws that are operating. By the, by the time I made this decision, I was, had been a, a, a regular naval officer in the Navy and I'd been commander ships. I knew my navigation. I knew really, I was, I'd done well in mathematics and physics and so forth. I, I was really quite well informed and I had to really consider all, that, all this comprehensive interplay so that we, I will develop a little more about that tonight because I, I am then an, a, working, a working experiment of, of, of now 46 years duration of what the individual might be able to do on board of our planet if he does take the initiative and commits himself to the, the, what I've said, to, uh, what, what can you learn from your actual experience or reliable experience of others? 
What can you learn about principles? How, the, how can they be employed to solve problems for, for the many? And how do you con how, what can the little individual do, if anything, on behalf of his fellow humans that great corporations can't do and the great massive political states can't do? And I saw one thing that individuals can do right away and do it fast is think. And, and a bureaucrat just does, is not allowed to think. He's not going to be able to earn a living because he gets involved with that. Because much of the thinking immediately involves you in saying things that need to be done that are going to take 45 years, 50 years, maybe 100 years. And, and, and no corporation or political system say, we can't afford, the payoff isn't there. I found society really tied up with a very short-sighted way with this year's profit, this year's crop, this year's political next election. So I said, I, immediately then, I'm, I find that I can really take a much larger overview and I'm going to, has, going to see something. And sure enough, it did begin to see very powerfully. I also then said that I, it's part of my experience that, that my fellow men do a great deal of talking with one another, <laughs> my fellow humans. And the, the great deal uh, of the talk that goes on is uh, really not even well, well thought out. Where one just says one cliche and that there's a bounce off cliche for that the other one says. And, and they may be thinking about something else altogether, just these words are just bantering back and forth. So, <clears throat> I said, I, I think of, of all the really extraordinary tools that humans have, the, the development of the word, ability to communicate, our experience one or the other, is by far the most impressive of all of them. Therefore, I said, here are these words, and, and the, the, here is a dictionary with a hundred thousand words approximate magnitude, that knowing how difficult it is <coughs> for humans to agree on anything, <laughs> that human beings have agreed that there are that many nuances of experience that need a special word, and they've been able to agree on a hundred thousand of those words as the right way of identifying that unique nuance of experience, it seemed to me the, the dictionary is the most extraordinary memorial of victories of humanity, that they really did want to communicate accurately and, and definitively and comprehensively. So that here's that dictionary. And I said, however, you and I can take one of any of those words and teach them to a parrot. That the, word, the words can be sounded off without any, any meaning being attached. So I saw that a great deal of being used the way of words, and particularly in my own part. I found myself the most offensive person I knew in, in the amount of words I was really using that, that I hadn't thought through wh why I was using it. I was just doing so many things on condition reflex. So I thought it would be quite a task at the age of 32 to, to un uncondition my reflexes, but I really set about to see how I could do that and how I could really then use what I do have. And I wondered, just from my experience, our first child, I felt that human beings are really born with much more of a range of, of uh, capability than is really properly accredited by the old world. This first is the first child being paralyzed, was unable to move around over here and there. Her eyes could travel to get information by touching something. You know how much children really continually touching, coordinating the sense of touch and the sense of smell and so forth. So she couldn't do that. And yet, the other thing, so she learned to, she developed her own kind of capability to get the information she wanted through the other living human beings that are around her. <laughs> and she became so sensitive to what they were sensing that, it be, uh, that suddenly my wife and I were just uh, uh, utterly surprised and there were two trained nurses we had uh, off and on. This little child, we, we, were about, we had, I was going to say something to my wife and really not, this, about something need to be attended to, not really talking directly to that child at all. And I had the words all formulated and just going to come out of my mouth, she'd say it over there. Faster than I could say it. And this would happen time and again to us. We realized that there really, this, this was really telepathetic because they were really phrases sometimes that this little child just would not have used. And therefore I became convinced that in this much all of us have experiences, which we say the only way that could be explained is by telepathy. <laughs> Everyone has had that, but there is no affirmation of there being any science or any, any, there's no way in which man could t refer to this as being reliable. Therefore, man, when he doesn't have any important 
scientific evidence, he tends to sort of disdain this, this subject. Anyway, the point is I, I personally have experienced, I'm sure you all have, things that you can only explain that way. But I said, I think then this, this is probably, because nature in a design is extraordinary, and so we have what we call fail-safe. So if one thing isn't working, other things work, because I personally also have very bad eyesight. Uh, very good with glasses, but very deformed lenses. And I, all I have to do is take off my glasses and, and see what I saw before I was four years old because I didn't get my glasses I was four. And it's, it's, a, it's a blur. I can make out a color area. There's a pink color area there, a little light blue. There's a yellowish. But I, I can't see any features of any face. There are some shadows, a little more, where my eyes or, or something like that, but that's all I have. So not until I was four did I see a human eye. And I, but yet I gained an enormous amount of information by my smelling and my touching and, and so forth, and I got on fine. So I said, here's this little child of ours who can't get around, and every human being is born with this telepathetic capability, but it's a fail-safe that would only be used when the, 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 other, the other capabilities are shut off. In other words, nature has her alternate, alternate ways of accommodating so that life can get its information. And I thought this child was really manifesting that to me. And this, this then told me, having had this extraordinary experience, this child was, was really brilliant. Her, her mind worked so beautifully uh, that I, I felt, I, I'm, here we're all born with something, and this is one, I'm just giving one case, so I said, there are probably great many other capabilities we have that are not properly accredited. Now, trying to organize all this, I said, if I then undertake to see what the human individual has that great corporations don't and great states, and the ability to then to think and think, commit yourself to thinking about whatever, whatever the size of the thing is that has to be thought about. And pay no time, don't worry at all about the time, and, and, and how, don't worry at all about how you're going to pay for things, how you're going to, people are going to eat, provided you're ready to commit yourself, but you must work very hard at it. And you must do everything possible that's intelligent. And so that I said, this word business is one of the things that I will have to get at because I'm going to have to give myself really a moratorium on speech. I couldn't get into a complete moratorium because there were things at times when for, for just the absolute safety of my wife and, and child, I had to say something. But my wife agreed to do all the talking to everybody that had to be talked to. And, and so I had almost a complete moratorium for almost two years. And I made up my mind that I would not make sounds until I was pretty sure what the effect of that sound would be on other human beings and that it really would be useful and I would not be in any way misleading the other human being. It was a, such an extraordinary gift we have. Now, these are typical of the disciplines I, I put upon myself trying to find out how the individual can really be, be effective in, on behalf of his fellows. Other things I said, I will never ask anybody to listen to me. I will only talk to human beings when they ask me to, 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 to talk to them. The reason I'm here with you tonight is because you have asked me to come and talk, but I'm very, very strict about this. I'm confident people are, are not listening when you ask them to listen to you. They only listen to you when they, you ask them, when they ask you to talk to them. So I said I have very few hours in, in my life to carry on, so I must really be economical and only then speak to them when they ask me to speak to them. Furthermore, I said I see that you and I are behaving the way we are because we are in a special environment and gravity is pulling our feet in towards this earth and we are breathing, the, we have the equipment, we have to breathe the air we have and so that we're very much a part of the great des of a design. And I see that evolution is continually changing things. Entropy means that every, uh, every local system is continually losing energies and the energies are lost by all the different local systems at different rates and different ways so they bring about all kinds of new uh, self-confrontation and the whole phenomenon is irreversible so that with change actually inexorable and, and irreversible I saw that there are numbers of options in the way the inexorable change could take place as for you and I we see the you and I need water but we can't drink it all when it rains we need it at, at very different increments and different rates so we see water being pulled by gravity in towards the center of the earth in pulling, it pulled on the hillside. And we see that you could move the rocks one way or another, that's possible, and you could get the water into a holding pattern. 
so you could valve it into our presence in the magnitudes and the times we want, and this would not disturb the universe at all. So I saw that, that you and I could participate in the, in the evolutionary transformation, provided we were being very thoughtful about what all the side effects would be and so forth. So th this, this became the, I wanted, wanted to see how, how the individual could get into a strategy like this and what he would then find it appropriate to adopt as self-disciplines to try to get, get rid of the conditioned reflection and to be effective. Also, I then said, I will not talk about, a th if, I, if, I try to, if I see a problem that needs to be solved, I'm not going to say to you, let, let's have, have, have somebody go out and pick up that log and move it off the road. It's my job to get it out of the road before something comes along in the night and, and is killed. So I must, I must go into act physical actions and, and not just give my idea to somebody else to execute <laughs> and try to persuade other people. I must really find then ways of solving problems by participating in the evolutionary transformations rearranging the rearrangeable and, and ir irrevocably being arranged environment, participate in it. Try to understand what are the complementations of why, what, what's, why are humans on, on board of our planet? Try to understand that and then run, try to understand then how to abet this functioning. Okay, I want to understand when I'm talking about it, an environmental alteration rather than trying to reform the human beings. I, I was uh, seven years old when the first automobile came into Boston. So the automobile was a very new experience in, in my life. I'd had my glasses for three years and I could have a pretty good look at that. <laughs> and, and like everybody else, every other kid, I was very excited by having only been able to walk from here to there. My family couldn't afford horses, but I had a bicycle. This idea that you really could get from here to there in this fast way was very terribly stimulating the imagination. At any rate, I saw that very rich people got the, had these automobiles, nobody else could afford it, and once in a while, a very rich man's son could drive it, or his daughter. And, and they, they had a party, they got all excited about it, and, and somebody got cracked up and was killed. And so the, the, uh, the society, we didn't have any of the highways we have today at all. They really were pretty poor. All, all, the, all the country roads were just dirt. Some, some of the inside uh, city roads were, were, were cobbled. <laughs> We didn't even have a thing we call macadams yet. So that uh, I saw that accidents would happen, and the accidents were usually happening where a man went around a corner too fast or uh, at a crossing and ran into a milk wagon or something. So I said, I, what, what, I, what I'm thinking about, I saw that everybody then re voted to have the town spend some money and give the policemen some money and, and they'd have him chase this man and, and give him a ticket. <laughs> That everybody then tried try to reform the driver. Be good, be careful, drive slowly, and so forth. So I said, I don't think the, the idea is to reform the human beings at all. That the human beings are born with something very great. And what I want to do is to avoid this happening. So I said, all we have to do is to bank the turn. Even the man is drunk, and the, 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 the cow does stir around the corner. And, and why he is drunk is something else altogether with, to do with other environmental conditions which have been inadequate and so forth. The environment became very important to me as, as not a thing, not the scenery, but I said, environment is a complex of events. <laughs> and the, the, the universe is environment. In fact, I've, I've developed a definition which I've made a little poem a few years ago. Environment to each must be all there is that isn't me. Universe in turn must be all that isn't, isn't me and me. And the only difference between universe and environment was me, the observer. Now, and the, I found all the universe and its environment was a set of events, some of them very slow, some of them very fast. And they impinged on us from outside ourselves and from inside ourselves. There's a microcosmic origin of the events and the macrocosmic. And they came at us in all directions. And some of them would not be very frequent as, for instance, the effect on human beings of what we call a nova, of a star exploding. We don't know much of what the end effects might be. But they don't happen often enough, so if you're designing something, that I would not know how to make an environment control nova-proof. <laughs> so I, I will leave that one out. I know what I'm going to be able to do for my human beings. I've got to, to commit myself to what can what can I accomplish within the magnitudes of, of effectiveness that a human being has? Now, 
I, I, I hope I'm getting over to a little, little of, the, of the mental process that went on and how you were led by your experience into saying, these are the, these are the disciplines you adopt, this is the way you carry on. So I said, I must always then work on the solution of a problem to reduce it to some kind of a, of a transformation, a, a permitted transformation of the, along with the rest of evolution, of the rearrangement of, of the furniture of our, of our environment in such ways as I felt would then help humanity avoid untoward events, give him more time to really consider his experience and find ways to help, help everybody else to have more time to really think and yet get perspective and have experience. So I said, what can I do on behalf of my fellow man that will not trespass on him? Because one thing I mustn't do is to trespass on him. And I, and I said, I, that, I think I can really understand that. Well, I must not, I, I must be able to increase his, his uh, options and his freedoms and not reduce his, his, his freedoms. Which would be what you do when you say, I'm going to try to reform you and uh, put, put restrictions on. I must do exactly the opposite. I must be able to make it possible to do all the things he does do, but, but in such a way that he's not going to get hurt. It's important for him to get information. You're not trying to avoid getting information. He's got to have that. But how can he get that information in such a way that he realizes the critical condition, yet didn't get hurt? <laughs> he can live to, to, to turn it to advantage. You can you really understand how you could, how you can work out. So I said, I see then there are great many things happening to great many individuals they don't know are happening to them. In other words, you didn't know that something's falling on your head. I, I happen to be looking that direction. And if I jump and stop it from hitting you in the head so you don't get killed, I don't think I've trespassed on you. In other words, I saw that, that if my eyes taught, and my experience taught me about things that are going to happen to human beings that they don't know are going to happen to them, yet that I, I know by my experience that they will destroy them, then if I then intercept and turn this to some advantage so that they have the time to make their own optional choice, I don't think I'm trespassing. You understand that, all right? And I saw we are all processes. Whether we like it or not, we are chemical processes. And that a great deal of our time is preoccupied in, in, in attending to that process. And I said, anything I might do, because I have experience that would teach me how I could accommodate your accommodation of your process in less time, to give you more time, we all, all we all, any of us have, is our total lifetime. So if I could cut down the numbers of, of hours and minutes that anybody else has to put into taking care really of just a chore and allow them to have more time to understand and, and commit themselves to invest their own in their own direction, this would not be trespassing. So I began to find myself dealing with an, a really macrocosmic, omnidirectional impingement of set of events. And here's, here's one of the very first payoffs that ever came. There, Ed Eddington, no, Sir James Jeans, defines science as the earnest attempt to set in order the facts of experience. That felt pretty good to me as a definition. And, I've, and I'll then give you how, how, how I really found how very good the definition really was because I said, if I'm going to then be concerned with all these events that impinge on human beings, I think that one of the first things I ought to do is to start writing down all the things I think you're, you're dealing with. <laughs> what do I remember of all the things that can happen to human beings? I said, I'm afraid this is going to be taking off a long time, but I better start in at least cataloging them. <laughs> and so I did start making lists and then did make a quite long list. And I was surprised within a few weeks I d couldn't think of anything else to put on the list. A few weeks later, thought of one more item, but there came a point where I'm filling in very rapidly for quite a while. I was putting down that whether people throw stones at you or somebody can just scowl at you, whatever it may be, these, these are all the things. Then it made a great difference if somebody scowled at you or somebody smiled at you, and I must put it all down. So I had all these items, and, and it was interesting about two, two years later when I getting out of that word moratorium. And I was asked to have lunch in New York. The Great, the great Depression, the great uh, crack up of the stock market grew, occurred in 1929, two years after I started doing this, this work that I'm talking about. And in 19, early 1930, I was asked to have lunch with uh, some architectural engineers and, and uh, no, these are editors of architectural and engineering magazines in New York. Depth of the Depression, 
they were trying to do something, but everybody's unemployed. And I was having lunch with these, these editors and I told them about my list of all the items I felt you had to deal with if you were going to deal on behalf of your fellow man in a competent manner. And I said, I don't think this doesn't fall just in architecture or engineering or anything. It's a very comprehensive challenge. And they were very interested that I had this checklist. So that same group decided to meet with me weekly in New York and we had something we call the Structural Study Associates. But as we met every, every, every week, the first thing they did was to try to add to this list. Finally, we, nobody in the group could think of anything more to add to the list, so we decided to publish it. We did publish it in an architecture magazine. But something really quite strange and mis mystical about publishing, talking to more people, to get it where it can't be really lost. It is, it is recoverable information now. Up to this point, if it seems important to you, yet it hasn't been published, you know, something happens to you and it really is valuable, you, you feel, feel this, this is, is responsibility. Once it's published out there, it's a little different. And right, I was able to think about a lot of other things, get that out of my way, because this thing was, this list was out of the way, and, and I was going through my file one day and suddenly saw the list again. And this time, in a sense, with the stranger's eyes, and I saw the, the list the way I had it, I felt it was very illogical, because I saw that I had hurricanes alongside of mosquitoes. And I said, I, I think this is logical. What I, I really ought to go, go over this whole list and rearrange it in, in what I call order of relative severity. <laughs> so I, I decided to try that out. And sure enough, I found that every item there could go into some order of severity. So in order to make it possible to classify it, I simply took uh, I, uh, the most, the, the, the most uh, epochal a danger, utter change, like, like the, the concept of, of a nova, the star exploding. Then I came to a very, very, very powerful and, and very disconcerting, and then not so powerful and not too disconcerting, and finally down to innocuous. Now, I, I found every item I had could go into one of those envelopes. Then I said, All right, I'm going to take this envelope and maybe I can even arrange within that envelope. Is this a little more severe than that? And you can see sure enough that was, so I kept sorting them out. Finally, I had them all sorted out. It's interesting, no item had to be left out of any of those, they all had something relative severity. So once I had them all together, I then republished them in order. And the minute that they were in order, and this is what, what Jean, Sir James Dean said, setting in, to trying to find order to set the, the, the facts of experience in order. And I had inadvertently done that. I didn't know about what, what, what he really was talking about when I first did that. At any rate, once they were in order, absolutely astonishing was to discover that the more severe, the least frequent. That they were in absolute order of frequency and magnitude, which conforms completely with quantum, the whole concept of, of uh, energy in our universe, where nature has a very big thing to do, she does, doesn't do it very frequently. And the very little things can happen very frequently, so that the microbes are much more frequent, tiny as they are, than, than earthquakes. And, and so th this seemed to be absolutely infallible. There was no question about it. the whole thing. Therefore, I could really, instead of calling this typhoon or, or smile, it really could really have a number. This, this, this gave me enormous confidence suddenly in the way uh, uh, that I had been handling things. Now, once, if you're dealing with something that's not going to happen but every two, three thousand years, if you're designing something that's only, only going to be useful for three years, there's no use in trying to bring in that every thousand year kind of, of, of anticipation. You know, really, then I saw that designing would, would deal in specific time dimensions. Whatever you design must be that way. This is very different from something we hear a great deal about nowadays of, of designed in obsolescence. That's really saying exactly how, how long are you warranted and then reassociating the, 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 the advantages of humanity in this particular way, because they're going to become obsolete. And you began to get into various other studies of great changes in tensile strength of metals and so forth. And the, under the new circumstances, if, this, if you had this greater strength, then you would do it in a little different way. You'll see this would become obsolete. So I got into many studies of, of curves, of rates of change that I think we know about, like particularly then the, these tensile strengths of the ferrous metals. We didn't have any high strength non-ferrous metals at the time. And I, but I made the assumption that 
aluminum would probably, the non-ferrous would probably go through the same pattern as the ferrous as we would learn alloys and so forth. And sure, so I plotted my curve, and very interestingly, it is really the curve of increase of tensile strength in the non ferrous who followed exactly the curve it plotted way back in 1927. Okay. I, I, I hope all of you really understanding then that what I'm trying to give you is, is it how the separate individual can really peel off and begin to organize himself. And, the, and I have been able to really get a whole lot of results. It's been, been surprising, but I. I find myself that I really had opened up something. I'm, I'm confident that anybody else had done what I did, he would he'd probably not only get the same results but get better ones because I, I have to recognize really how many limitations I really do have. So that, that I've been able to get, I really got where well, I, I could say as, as the end of this year there will be over a hundred thousand geodesic domes somewhere around the world, more than half the countries of our earth. And one has just been put up over the South Pole, the exact South Pole. And there are a number of them ringing the North Pole, where they're under the most severe conditions of nature, where no other structure would go. That's why they are in those places. Nothing else would do. You know, in fact, the, the first of my structures were used only because nothing else would do. And in fact, at the time that I began then get thinking about getting environment control back in, in, in 1927 and so forth, seeing how I could bring advantage for other life, I, I was so from, I'd been in the building world and I'd come out of the Navy and gone into the building world and, and I got up 240 billion, very familiar with building codes and, and, and man's customs and what he, would, what he would fund and so forth. And I said, I think one of the most important ways that I, I can give myself good thinking is to undertake to think about how I would develop my environment control to the North Pole. <laughs> Well, you, uh, there must nobody be standing around freezing to death. I must find a way of giving man environment control in, in the most severe conditions that man could think of. So I, my, literally, my very first thinking was go back to the old Dimaxian house. You find I have, you know, back in 1927, a drawing of a dirigible making delivery of a building to the North Pole so that nobody would freeze to death. Then how, how could you design it so it would be light enough to be carryable, to could be carried by a dirigible? Well, this seemed absolutely preposterous at the time. Suddenly began, all, all these things happening, many, many of my structures I find are being delivered by air today. In other words, the conditions are, have actually come about. And the only reason they were then, this, this dome at the South Pole, is nothing else could possibly take the strains, nothing else could get in fast enough so a man wouldn't freeze to death in a very short time of getting it installed. Okay. So I've, I've seen these things happen, and, and, and uh, I've, I've, one of my domes on top of Mount Fuji is, is, a, is a weather radar, but there it is, and, and the, the Japanese say, we, we, we use this, and just your, your design, and it's the only thing that would take the enormous winds up there, fantastic strains, it's the highest point on Mount Fuji, tiny little thing, about a 30-foot about a diameter sphere. Now, all of this is by way of trying to give you some confidence in your own proclivity, because I find a younger world is, is, is generally tending to do what I found myself doing about that time. Not because I did it, but because it is really an evolution. In other words, I think I broke, I, I got into a pattern that evolution was, was advancing possibly a little earlier by my deliberate peel-off. That's really all I can say to you, but I, I, I want you to have one of the things I really have learned then, through all those years, nobody then, there's nothing I can budget, I can't say I'm going to be able to afford to do that at all. I just have to say, what needs to be done, and how do you, what you need to know in order to be able to do it competently. And no, 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 no matter how much time it's going, you've got to find out how to do that competently. And you've got to do it so economically that it is, if, if this is something necessary for humanity, it's in view of all the other things that have to be done, so you're not using up all the resources of man in this one undertaking. It must be co co cooperatively permitted by all the other considerations. Now, I'm I'm pausing now to think about, the, I, we only have so much time, you, you, you asked me to talk to you and I want to give you my absolute best and I want to be sure I'm not dwelling too long on some special aspect in here. But I, I would just point out then about this various, uh, these various uh, undertakings. I did then find I'm going to need quite a lot, but 
how much of that could you do yourself and you know, don't have to hire somebody else to do <laughs> if you spent this little more time. And what is the absolute, what do you have to do to really prove that this thing really works? What is the minimum you have to do to prove it works? It's, there's a principle in there, so how do you get the principle disclosed? Are you really understanding the principle properly? And is it realizable along those lines? So you're not doing this then to, to, do, to make, you're not going in to make money, you're not trying to sell something, never mind what it looks like, how do you get the information? Now the point is that through those years I've then gone into many, many such formulations. I call this, I call it comprehensive anticipatory design science exploration. You, you can't say a professor you're going to do it, it's an exploration. And, but I have found my way in finding many, many principles. Now, for the last 20 years, the, the credit has gradually built up for what I'm doing because of things that I did find out and I was able to publish or, or somebody asked me about and it's been demonstrated. Gradually been found that many of these curves you plotted are, are, are found to be the reliable curves, that's the way it's coming out. So I'm finding myself being accredited and therefore my responsibility increases very, very greatly that, that, you, that you've chosen to ask me to come here and you're sitting here committing your time to, to me, I find it a very extraordinary matter. Yes, sir? In a sense, I really, I really am talking that way now. I, I will try. I've, I've, got to be, I've, I've got to be very intuitive, because I, I tell you what I do. I watch, I'm very, I can't, can't think out loud the way I am. If, for instance, if there were too bright a light in my eyes, I have to see other humans' eyes. I really am doing, I, I find I can really converse with a lot of people where I might just be able to converse with you just by being very sensitive to your face and what, what you're saying. You, are you interested? You want to go on? I'm, I'm the only one making, making the, the sounds. Now, so I'm very sensitive to others besides yourself. I'm, 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 I'm glad you say what you say, but I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm going to use, use those words, and yet I'm quite confident that everything I'm talking about is related to that. The I wanted to get out of point, which is that the, the magnitude of the undertakings that I had gotten into have gradually been accredited so that for the last 20 years now, the, I've been operating where the total cost of things I do annually is about $200,000. And, 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 and I don't go bust and I haven't had, got any foundation, nobody to back me. This is not done in the patron. These are credits that come, but, but I, they, I'm at a point now where some, if you ask me to talk to you, I've got to then prorate that to the total amount of my experience that is what it costs me to carry on. So I, I'll ask you to give me, give me that amount. And I find that, that, that yes, that, that seems to be, work, it works with humanity, it turns out to be a relatively small amount. But the point is that I don't have any manager, I don't have any promoters, nobody's going out and asking anybody to listen to me. I don't allow any, anything like that anywhere near me. Many, many times, and during the 46 years we're talking about, I've come awfully close to going bust. But I've, I've, never, I've, I've never walked away from any situation, and then I, I don't owe anybody any money. And, and I'm, I'm really very confident that it's a, clean, it's a clean record. I've been able to carry on, not at somebody else's expense. That's one of the things that must not be at somebody else's expense. Okay. All of this then is to, 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 I've said all these things, and I want you to really have, a, one thing I've learned through all of this, and, when you're, you're terribly worried, because you're, you're, I have now many secretaries working with me and other human beings that are helping me, and they say, how are you going to pay for this? Look at this big bill. And I just say, just don't worry. I've, I have really learned that, that the credits come in in an entirely different direction. So when I hear people talking about budget, so well, there's nothing I can possibly budget. I don't know what's coming. I live really in a cresting wave of, of pure event. And the big test of whether I'm really doing what I'm supposed to be doing is whether it is being accredited. You understand? And, and I pay very great, there have been times when I've gone a little off course and, and I find things going very bad. So I say, what am I supposed to do about that? And what is, what, so I'll go over and tackle something else that I think feels, and that turns out to be the one that makes, keeps it going. So you have to be very, very sensitive to everything around you and all that's going on, all of humanity. So I'm very, I really do have that. And I've, I find that all of us are born that way, every kid, and I've really gradually been re able, able to recapture 
sensitivity I was, was born with that I can remember having my, how, how a dewdrop first looked at me the first time I ever saw it. <laughs> it's very extraordinary matter why that thing had this lovely glistening there. How could it be holding that shape but sitting on a little petal? <laughs> uh, life, life now looks, it seems to me, I'm now really experiencing life the way I felt about it as a child. Every, every second of it is just couldn't be more rich and, 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 and inspiring. I, I can tell you that's one of the, the, the most important reward I'm getting is that, that I do find myself seemingly um, a, a, a joined tremendously, t or in, in, in incredibly, mysteriously excited by the total experience. Now, I, I, will, I will cut off what I've been talking about, I want, but I want to, because you would introduce me in a generous way, I want to be sure that nobody here thinks of my, anything I'm saying in the terms of, I don't take any of these things in, as, as, as uh, that, that I'm fancy, I don't, uh, uh, my, the more I've learned that my indebtedness to all those before us, all the people we don't know, you've had enough experience to see that mother doing something with that kid, the, the extraordinary sacrifice human beings make for others, the, the real devotion they put in tasks and never get, anybody doesn't hear about it. And I'm quite confident all those words which I can use, that in the dictionary, you, I don't know how we got those extraordinary words that all the, our indebtedness to everybody is so great. I can't possibly say there's something special. I'm, I'm, I'm in, the, in a relay system and we are in a state of evolution and evolution is quite clearly a, in a great acceleration. Now, I have lots, of, here I'd like you to see again the way I, the way I see things. All the charts we use to plot curves, we have the baseline is what they call norm, the norm. And then uh, the curve then becomes abnormal. And everything that's going on in our lives are these curves of increasing acceleration. So everything seems to get more abnormal. Now this is simply because there's still residual in the condition reflex of humanity. Something was of the Newtonian world where Newton spoke about it, a body persisting in a state of rest or in a line of motion except for the by it. But normal was at rest. As when I was young, everybody's really assuming is I throw something and then it stops. That rest, at rest is normal and acceleration is abnormal. And the, really the great contribution of Einstein, the biggest thing out of the, he was able to interpret from the experimental evidence was that, that the norm is 186,000 miles a second and not standing still, that everything is in motion. And, the, and this is the unfettered motion in vacuo. All the other motions are because they're interferences and, and turnings and twistings and not times. Therefore his whole equation about matter comes out of this. Now, how much, how much energy was tied up locally by self-interfering? How much is knotted in there? And, and his equation proves to be correct in due course. But the point is, I said, I see what we ought to do. All of our charts say man is getting so abnormal that he's apparently going into, into race schizophrenia. But I saw what we do is to turn the chart 90 degrees. And that we were in a, we were in a, a tailspin and we're just pulling out in a straight level flight. This, this is the normal. <laughs> now, when, I, I want you to understand some of the tools I'm working in here. One of the things I then wanted to know, if I could discover some kind of a basic rate of the effect of, on humanity of what man had been discovering in these principles that are operative in the universe. So I, if you try to take a list of all the inventions of man, <laughs> The, your, somebody is, is open-ended, somebody finds something you'd left out of the list. I want to try to find a good closed system. To do good thinking, you have to really think in the terms of closed system. Now, one of the things I discovered was that, as you will, the, on pure science side, there are 92 regenerative chemical elements. Man has gone into the non-regenerative beyond, but we, there are 92 regenerative chemical elements, and they're absolutely, each one is, utterly unique and that's why they're an element and each one has beautiful mathematical identifiability with the one electron, one proton and so forth. Builds, membership requires that and you can't duplicate any of the others. So I became interested then in the family of regenerative chemical elements and the rate at which humanity had gradually apprehended them, been able to isolate them. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to say something because I think out loud and, and I'm being bothered. I have to leave the room for a minute if you don't mind, and excuse me, maybe somebody else has to leave the room, but I have to leave the room. 
I, I used to wonder what I'd do if I did have to do that. And the final thing you do is just tell everybody. Do you, do, you, do you want to carry on? I'd like to ask the photographers to stay in one place because apparently it really bothers human beings as you get it, it disturbs the... I, I work very hard on... If you notice I don't have a blackboard. I used to use models and, and pictures and things like that. I've learned that the human imagination is so powerful that if I can really describe things properly, you, you really see it much better than you would on the, on the screen or a blackboard. And, and then it really belongs to you if you've thought it through yourself. So that I find that people moving around so far do tend to, to break this concentration. It's very difficult really to get where, where we're almost unaware of one another. And yet, yet we do that many times. Now, we're, I don't mean we're unaware of the importance of the other one, but that we really can begin to think very, very accurately. Now, <laughs> I spoke about then the, the, the 92 regenerative chemical elements because it does start with one, the hydrogen, and goes up to then the 92nd uranium. These, I said, if I would take the historical rate in which man isolated those chemical, and we know he isolated those chemical elements, it would be a family of events. Is a closed system. So I found that man had discovered, when history opens, man had discovered 12 chemical elements. They, they're, most of it, I, I may be right, say iron, copper, copper, silver, gold, uh, tin, lead, mercury, zinc, carbon. The first known isolation of a chemical element by a human being was 1200 and it was arsenic. There were 200 years lapse and the next isolation was made. This time it was an antimony. Then there was another 200 year lapse and suddenly ups up began to go, just very rapidly, almost one every two years. And that curve, I, pl I plotted it very carefully. They didn't come in by the numbers, of course. They came in very, very, very odd as far as the, uh, the, how many uh, electrons they had or whatever it might be. And when, once the curve was plotted, then it was something, again, very interesting, because this is, I've made it then 1200 to 2000 AD to have my chart adequate for the whole story. And they, the curve goes in acceleration, but there, there are slowdowns and accelerations quite clearly. And it was very interesting to discover that all the slowdowns are during war. Up this time, and I first, I showed this chart to the scientists in Washington during World War II, too, when they were, they were great quandary, because people are saying war is good for science and some say it's bad. But what you discover is during war, the discoveries of science of yesterday are put to work in a destructive way, but the, 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 the science itself very much depressed by the war. And right, you can, you can read that in the curve very clearly, because there are well-known wars and then the hips are, and, and slowdowns are very sharp. Now, Next thing I'll then tell you about what I was doing, I'm having plotted this curve, which gave me really then a, a, a background of pure scientific kind of discovery as a, 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 against time. Then I said, I'm going to, I want to know what man has able been to do with the, this kind of capability to make it possible for him to cope with environments in a little more effective manner. So I set a uniform task which was that man, with the knowledge that is now current at any given time, he must now be able to penetrate, he must make a complete circuit of the earth in an environment he had not been able to get on with before. And he must do it by with being within the safe environment. He's able to control the energies operative outside of the controlled environment to, to, to get him around the universe. So the first 
such case with going around the wooden in a wooden sailing ship, where he's inside of his ship and he's he's using the winds outside to get him around. The next there's a big there's a 350 year lag and he suddenly goes around in a steel steamship, and then. Very, very shortly after that, 75 years later, he goes around in an aluminum airplane. And 35 years after that, he goes around in, in an exotic metals rocket. <laughs> and I found then the, there was a, this lag between new states of the art <laughs> of going around the world. And, and there was, was a 35 year, and then the 75, and then the, the say 350, 75, down to 35. Then I found the rate at which he went around was different. He went around the wooden sailing ship, it took him two years. And in the steamship, it took him two months. <laughs> and in the aluminum airplane, it took him, at the first time he went around, about two weeks. Could have been a few days. And in the, in the exotic metal rocket, a little over one hour. Now what I have here is a basic curve of basic acceleration against time of the, of the science rate at which he's acquiring the basic scientific capability. And against that, out of that kind of capability, there's some synergetically, some totally manifest capability to cope with, with total experience very differently and to sweep out much more of his earth, to know more about his earth. Then rate, there's three, three rates of gain. There's a basic rate of gain here, then there's a contraction of the time lags between the new art, and then there's a rate of this great acceleration which it does go around. And so this is a third power acceleration curve. And, the, and if you look at that curve of 800 years and, and, and see those contractions, which is, because I made a little, put it on, on my chart, the picture of the little wooden, wooden sailing ship and then the picture of the steamship and so forth, you can read it on there, and you can see this contracting. In fact, once you look at that, you say, something, something within a very short amount of time, we're going, you're going to go around the world and possibly I'll send you by radio. I want to, as, because each one of these ways of getting around was so utterly unpredicted by the previous. Utterly unpredicted. I, 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 when I talk about then getting into curves and plotting, I want to give you a little way in which I also can then look at things quite a big way and, and, and uh, I'm, I'm on the alert to really look for a very great change and, and have a little sense of, because I find conditioned reflex just won't say yes, but the information says you've got to understand now. Some totally, in all the things I'm talking about, I really have learned over these 46 years how very reliable, whatever the truth is, you really can find, if you're, if you're competent and thorough about looking at it, you really do get information that's infallible. And if you dare to stick with it, it, it all comes out all right. So I, I simply will go back to, just to, to Milton, the poet, I mean, daring to be true. <laughs> now, I'm going to change the way I'm talking with you into, making another kind of approach. Incidentally, regarding that Utopia Oblivion, which I was asked, I have written a book, Utopia or Oblivion, and, and I really put into everything that I really think about why I, the reason I use that title. So if anybody really is interested in that, they can read Utopia Oblivion, because it is a Bantam book and it's very low cost, paperback. Now, I, I would like very much tonight, because I think these are, these are the most extraordinary times and I'm really very eager to make some kind of a, if I can, a breakthrough in what, what we're finding out, because I've learned that thinking out loud this way, often we do come in sight of some very new aspects of, of what humanity is going through on board of our planet. To, to make any of my exploration cogent and, and effective, I have to introduce a couple of things that I'm very deeply convinced of now, personally, that I feel that I, I really had to learn that it was so and really work out that it is so, because it was not evident. <laughs> Now, there are really very few great scientific discoveries, and the great scientific discoveries because what was discovered really wasn't evident. And we get down, down to why they were not evident, there's a very good reason. I've often asked audiences and talked about the phenomenon of synergy. Synergy meaning behavior of whole systems unpredicted by the behavior of any of the parts taken separately, considered only separately. And all the great scientific discoveries are all synergetic. There was nothing, I'm going to give you then the most powerful of all, the, all of them, simply what, what Newton finally discovered as a consequence of, of Copernicus' stimulation of, of Tycho Brahe, Kepler, Galileo. Finally, Newton was able to put something together. And it was, we're talking about 
mass attraction, where there's not electromagnetics involved, it's purely just mass inter-attraction. The attraction then that holds the moon to the earth, and the attraction that holds the earth into the solar system and holds the whole universe together. And all the integrities of our universe are in there. Now, when you get into his mass attraction law, the first thing he does, because Newton was very effective, he'd already had Kepler identify there was some kind of a tensive re restraint. And Kepler was so excited because he's, that he'd really found great regularities and yet there was no mechanical linkage. He said, how could you have such extraordinary mathematical regularity without some kind of mechanical linkage of these planets? And, and Newton say, I swing a weight around my head <laughs> and it's in tension, I'm holding it in tension on, on the string, but I let go of it, it goes off like that. And they said, matter, if I do it a little harder, it goes a little further, but then Earth's, the Earth's attraction is so powerful, it takes over and pulls it in this way. I send it off this way, and the Earth pulls it in that gap. So the Earth contradicts me very quickly, and no matter how hard I do it, the Earth takes it over really very quickly. Earth apparently is very powerful. And apparently there's a strong pull between the Earth and the Moon, because there are the waters, the tides being lifted on our planet daily by that great pull. So, he said there's no question, it's a very, the, the bigger the mass, apparently the more dominant it is. Therefore, in involving his mass attraction law, he said, first thing you do is to multiply the two masses times each other, the two masses involved that you're considering. Then he found, because Galileo before him had gotten into experiments in bodies going down inclined planes at various angles and free falling. And Galileo discovered what he called accelerating acceleration of free falling bodies. Newton, in trying to understand what's going on, said, inasmuch as there is this, apparently, this great strong interaction, it could be that if I, if the Earth was suddenly, by some miracle, limited, absolutely just annihilated, disappeared, the Moon would then be free to carry on. <laughs> it would be released from the pull and it would carry on in a different way. This is how he evolved his law of motion, that the body would persist in, this, in the line of, of, of travel, except it's affected by other bodies. So he then figured a sudden annihilation of the Earth for a given astronomical time, because he was very faithful to his astronomical observations. So he said, if at this sudden moment, which is going to be next week when I'm going to try to make some more experiment, if, if suddenly the Earth were annihilated, then the moon would move off in a straight line. This is what, what the line would look like against the observed stars. Then with his identified theoretical line of, of, of escape of the moon, he then measured the rate on that particular moment at the, at the, that the moon was falling into the earth from the theoretical line. And he found the rate it was falling into the earth exactly agreed with Galileo's accelerating acceleration. Now when you say accelerating acceleration, what you really mean is multiplying the number times itself, and you and I call that second powering. If you're considering your reflex, you may call it squaring, but nature's not doing any square, it's all simply second power. So the point is that Newton then found that when you first thing you do is multiply the two bodies times themselves, and if you halve the distance between the two, you find that the attraction is, is, is actually fourfolded. It's increasing at the rate of the second power. And this his, his, his theoretical formulation then had employ, applied by the astronomers to one after another of the astronomical behaviors and always been able to explain and predict. And the due course, which he did know, in the microcosm, to get into to, in the atomic areas where no electromagnetics happen to be involved and the mass and attraction laws are, are, are quite clearly and still, still able to predict the behaviors. Now, what I'm getting at is going to be very exciting, which is that you do have then the mass of this one and the mass of that one. Those are characteristics of that part. I spoke about synergies of behavior of whole systems unpredicted by behavior and the parts taken separately. And the simplest system you have is two. So the simplest one I'm considering then, they're just in the pull of the moon and the earth. So you have then the, whatever the mass of the earth is, and there's the mass of the sun, and they really bring about a very powerful kind of an interaction because they are very great. But there's nothing in one of them by itself that says that as they get nearer, the in inter attraction is going to increase to the second power. Nothing in by itself that says as you get nearer to some other body that the relationship is going to change. 
other than you might say, well, I can see it a little more clearly. That's not a second power. Okay? I, I'm, I, this is most overwhelming evidence you have. So you find really characteristic almost all the great generalized principles of that second power. E equals e equals MC, the second power is in there every time. The second power then is a, here's a relationship between that is not predicted by any of the, any of the qualities or the behaviors of the, in the, any of the parts considered separately. That's all I wanted to get out. That there is synergy. In fact, that's, this is the reason why the great scientific discoveries had not been discovered because people were looking at what they could find out about the parts. There was, it, and so the relation, inter, interrelationship was not predicted. Now, every one of the great scientific generalization such as this, in order to qualify as, as what you call a scientific generalization, there can be no exceptions. <laughs> well, no exceptions means eternal. <laughs> what we're really confronted with here, there, man has made a discovery of a number of these apparently eternal principles operating in our universe. And these eternal principles that are operating in our universe, if you begin to look at them holistically and not just be a specialist, you find one of the most interesting, none of them contradicts any of the others. Not only do they not contradict one another, but every one of them are interaccommodative of the others, and many of them are interaccommodative with exponential rates of interaugmentation. Inter it's a very extraordinary matter. Now, when you get to, and, and every one of these generalized principles, let's, let's go back to man discovering the lever. And the lever isn't just the tool, the bar that you use to lever with, there had to be a fulcrum. There had to be the inertia against which that fulcrum works. There had to be the load to be worked on. There had to be effort played at the other end of the lever. It's a very complex matter. And you discover, however, that by virtue of knowing what the increment from the fulcrum to the load is, you go out one of those, you have an even balance. You go out two, and you have two to one advantage. A little tiny man who with his muscles might be able to lift three or 400 pounds, or some exceptional man, can suddenly, with this kind of thing, lift a ton and two tons. By pure principle, man was then able to, to, to begin to participate in the alterations that are going on in the environment by, of evolution in a very much more powerful way. Now, and then later on he learned not just by his muscle, but just let the water being pulled in by gravity towards the center of the earth fall in the end of it, make the water wheel, and began to be able to do extraordinary amounts of work. Now, having discovered the generalized principle of the, math and the mathematics of a lever, of leverage, how it works, you'll find that it'll work anywhere on the moon and it doesn't have to be a wooden lever, which all his first ones are wood, he didn't know any other material. But suddenly you find it could be steel, it could be reinforced concrete, reinforced plastic, whatever. It could be aluminum. And it works on the moon, works anywhere in the world, anywhere in the universe. But you could, even though you know that and you know the mathematics of it and you can design a lever, you can't design a generalized lever. You'll have to design a special case lever. Now, here we come to extraordinary realization of the difference between brain and mind. The brain is always dealing with each special case. It's coordinating the sensings of our, of our senses and it's photographing and storing this very tightly and then you can recall it and you reconsider it and restore it and recall it again. But brain has nothing but special case. Mind and mind alone is able to review the special cases and from time to time discover a generalized principle operating as a relationship between them that's not of them. This is ab absolutely unique to the human. We don't have any other phenomenon in the universe manifesting this capability of having access to great generalized principles. But our, so our case, our life subjectively is always special case, a series of special cases. So our mind has the capability to discover the generalized principle. If you want to use one, it has to be a special case again. It doesn't have to be wood or steel or whatever it is, such and such a size. So subjectively, objectively, we're all special case, and every special case is terminal. But mind is dealing with this great eternity. It's a very extraordinary capability. Now, th this, th these are the things that began to overwhelm me as I began to try to, to, to use my mind and, and to do good thinking, which we all have the capability to do, and that you and I would have then the capability of access <coughs> to the great, another thing I'll say about it, when you get a complex <coughs> of omni interaccommodative principles, which are only intellectually discoverable, absolutely weightless, abstract, just mathematics, the, I would call a, what, would, what you would call it, I call a design, is that where you have the parts in certain orderly relationship one to the other, you determine that's where you like to make it. 
I say, what we have discovered is an a priori great design, the great design of the universe. We don't know a little about it. Every one of these discoveries has come out of the, what was previously unknown. <laughs> We've gradually pulled the curtain aside just a little bit on the unknown and discovered some knowability of extraordinary reliability, inter absolute eternal reliability. That you and I then have access to a little, at least a corner of the great design of the universe. Is a very, I said, if I want to catch on to how and why you and I are here, I don't think it, nothing could be more important to me than to discover that we have that capability and no other, other phenomena we know of in the universe has. Now I want to get to you and I thinking about the total of information that we really do have about our universe. And also like to get you to feel with me the, the uh, really some of the difference between the effectiveness, competence of the mind versus our muscle that you and I, as muscle, and are very, very tiny, we're just physical. And on our, our little globe itself, all the human beings on board of our globe today could all go indoors in, in New York City, greater New York City. Very few of us are tiny. <coughs> we couldn't be tinier on, on, on the globe. <coughs> and coming in from the moon, you can't, see, you can't even see the, uh, the five-mile-high five mountain, let alone a five-foot-high man. So that we're, we're invisible on the tiny little globe, and our little globe itself <coughs> is only one hundredth the diameter of the sun. And our sun is a very small star. Betelgeuse in Orion's belt, which you can see when the bright stars there, makes you say that's Orion's belt. Is this, its diameter is the larger than the orbit of the Earth around the sun. That's a good sized star. We're a very small one, and we're our star sun, where all life support comes from, Absolutely, completely. No, no radiation from the sun, no light. And this en energy as radiation from the, from, the, from the sun coming to us is really, I say it's radiation coming to us by radio. <laughs> we have life support coming from radio, by radio 92 million miles away is in itself an extraordinary piece of design. And we find then the sun being very small is one of a, only a hundred, is one of a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. And little man, with his beautiful mind, discovering principles such as refraction of light, as discovering telescopy to step up and step down information, so he can really get get such information as as, as to get the great to produce the great Palomar telescope and to, and to sweep out the information we have now of the sweep out of the Palomar is that we have a billion such galaxies. A billion galaxies, approximately, we say, 110, 100 billion stars each. And if we begin to get to thinking about what I'm saying, about 99 and, and considerable percent of all these stars are invisible to our naked eye, but they are omnidirectionally observed, all these galaxies, and, and so that their, their relative plentitude is such that one is really overlapping the other in diameter. And they would have been, in fact, very much like all the atoms can, uh, if we have a great steel spher spherical shell around us, say a, a one eighth of an inch steel plate, the, the relative pox number of atoms in that steel plate would be like all those stars around us. That we are in the center of such an enormous observed uh, coexistence in our universe. It's, and that we're, that, that this little planet of ours, you couldn't even identify in diameter against the si size of the sun when you see sun, when you look at it through a, a cloud, a little disk. It, 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 to our eye, if you just measure it at arm's length, it's about one inch in diameter. Uh, our engineer scale, you can see a fifth of an inch, you can't see a hundredth of an inch, it's a blur. You wouldn't be able to see our little planet which is one one hundredth of an inch against that little disk of the sun. So the size of you and I in this universe couldn't be more infinitesimal. We couldn't be more than a tiny little space program. We are practically just nothing but space itself in, in, in relative to the kind of um, size of all these other phenomena. And yet little man on board the planet discovering about refraction of light, able then to discover each of the chemical elements having its unique frequencies, been able to take all the light from all these different directions, running through the spectroscope and been able to take actually inventory the relative abundance of all the, those 92 regenerative chemical elements in the universe. The little man on board of our planet is able to get the information I'm dealing with. It's, it's incredible. And I think about then what his little muscle can do, nothing. 
That's it. One second of one hurricane is, just gives off more energy than all the muscle all man all history has ever done. Nothing. So we are, the really thing about man is his mind. Now, I would then begin to look for this total inventory. We, of, of, we know there are the 92 unique chemical elements because each one is unique by its unique behaviors and so forth. And they each have their own unique frequencies. And you discover that there are 12 basic degrees of freedom with every event. I can give you how to get that experimentally, but if you, for a moment, just, if you accept that, I, no, I don't even ask you that. It takes a minimum of 12 spokes to make a stable wire wheel. Hmm. Where does it doesn't there, there are 12, there's six positive, six negative. You find the spokes that have to come from the positive side of the wheel to the negative side. If you have a drum, drum head, it just vibrates like that. So what you have with the wire wheel is two drum heads spread from one another. It takes a minimum of, of, of six on each side to, to come in tangentially to the hub so there's no torque and so forth. All right? Twelve great basic degrees of freedom. Every event in the universe, and you could expand those, those vectors in going round in a circle, say hexagon like that, back where you started, or you could go off six, six magnitudes away. And there's so many, and, and the, the fantastic range of frequencies of events, it's such that we, our game of universe, if you think about chess, has to be played on a plane. This is omnidirectionally played, and it's played in such a way that if there's nothing on this, on this point at this time, you can go through. And so we have so many frequencies to employ that there really are very few interferences in our universe. And so we have all this hydrogen moving around, have all the radiation, and with very few interferences so that you and I could put a, over, a, I think it's something like two million now, different wideband radio sets in this room and get to, tuned in two million different programs. They're right in this room now, coming through this wall, paying no attention to anything. Uh, to get a little idea of how extraordinary this universe is designed then with all these degrees of freedom and so forth. And I will then give the most recent information physics really has in this century, very greatly affected by Einstein's interpretation of the speed of light experiments and so forth. But we have then science saying we do not have any experimental evidence and energy being created or being lost. But apparently we're dealing in a in a finite, eternally regenerative universe. Now, I want you to think about yourself being designer of eternally regenerative universe with all those, those great galaxies I've spoken to you about with all the degrees of freedom, all the chemical elements, all these unique capabilities. And, and the design is so well that I say nothing contradicts anything else yet. The whole thing is so, some totally co competently done that is eternally regenerative going through a continual tra transformation everywhere at different rates. Fantastic piece of design. Now I'm going to come to a very much lesser kind of complex design that you and I might be able to develop out of our knowledge of principles. As for instance, a great giant air transport. We say this is 747. You have going to have a great many instruments there and for the pilot to, to confront the pilot. He has to have it or you couldn't possibly fly that plane safely. He has to know whether the number three engine is overheating, whether the pressure manifold is too much pressure in the manifold, whatever it may be. And there are many of the dials that give him information where they're just really monitoring and there has already been developed a feedback what you do about the variation, and, but he's, the other dial tells him whether the feedback is working. But then, then there are other information he gets where he has to make an adjustment over here to go along with it. But there are quite a few of the informations he receives which he has to put together synergetically by virtue of the fact that the human has access to generalized principles and really understands a little about gravity and so forth, where he has to make a decision in view of his knowledge of the great generalized principle of the universe. Otherwise, the thing wouldn't work. All right, that's just for a little airplane. I'm talking now about designing great eternally regenerative universe. I would certainly say in a great design such as, as, as that, you'd have to have some local sensing capability that is getting very important information where a problem was develop, developing which could only be solved by actual access to the great generalized laws themselves. And I say that's exactly what we're doing in this universe. We are on board this planet. We have the universe as far as we can find out is pulsative. Some places are importing, other parts of the universe are exporting. The stars are all exporting. Our planet is one of the places where energy is being imported. 
and we have then where the importing is going on, there's a great deal of sorting to go on and, and to get the energies stored very deeply sometimes, say 20 billion years from now to become a star. But at any rate, this is where energy is energy getting, getting concentrated again for that kind of a purpose, some kind of purpose. And you and I are on board this, this planet where energy is being, being concentrated and in an increasing orderly way. Every one of the receipts we find then, all the vegetation impounding the sun radiation, which you and I can't take through our skin, by photosynthesis converting beautiful orderly molecular structures. And find all the other the, the living phenomena living on those, those, the, those by relay building more and more of the beautiful molecular structures. So all the biologicals are making an enormous amount of very orderly molecular structures. And these get buried ever more deeply by siltings and, and winds and, this, and, the, and the erosion of rocks. And so they get deeper and deeper. When the pressures are adequate, enough time, they get turned into what are called fossil fuels, where the energies are then stored, highly concentrated to be, to be employable later on sometime. But here's where the universe has a savings account and really trying to build it up. And for you and I then to expend any of that is in a sense a, a very illogical, unless we expend it very much more slowly than the rate at which it's accumulating, because that's what's going on here. Now, I'm now making, this became my working assumption, that man has an, his function, what I call entropy, is where all the stars are giving off energy, and the entropy is increasingly disorderly, and there are then the places where energy is being collected in increasingly orderly ways, which is exactly what we have manifest here on our planet of the vegetation doing, then converting in this orderly manner and all the other biologicals doing it. I call this syntropic in contradistinction to entropic or coming apart. So I find that by far the most powerful syntropic capability on board of our planet is this little human being with this access to the generalized laws themselves by which of which he can then cope with problems that just couldn't be biologically co coped with by themselves at all. Where well, it's not a matter of muscle, but understanding principle. Now, this, this seems to me to be fairly reasonable. And the way, way I fortify that working assumption is the fact that if I want to find something really common to all human beings in all history, no matter what race, what language they use, no matter, simply find that every life is simply con just a series of problems, problems, problems. That we're here to field problems. I use the word feeling as you'd use it as in baseball. And that you find that all of the games that man play, he does gets things momentarily disorderly and must convert it to order in the quickest possible way. And so this is exactly what, what you and I are trying. When the child just says, I want to understand. And, and, and when, when you don't understand, it's a problem. You've got to try to understand. Get it in order. How does it fit in the, in the big picture? And you find little children being born and immediately manifesting the most extraordinary interest in the total universe, asking the most beautiful question, trying to get things arranged in order. <laughs> now, the drive then to understand nothing could be more powerful than the human being. All right, so this is my working, whether I'm right or wrong, this is my working assumption, this is our function. And, yes, yes, sir? What, what about the fact that everything is separated from everything else? So, No, I, I say, no, we have both operative. We've known a great deal about the, all the stars, because all the stars are giving off energy and, and radiating, and we have then, this is the entropy. And entropy has been very visible to us by virtue of the energy it gives off. But where energy is being collected, we, if no energy would be given off so that you wouldn't get any, any, any information about it. The only one we really know about is our own planet, where we, we have then the experimental evidence that energy is being collected and converted in, into, and in, in stored, stored, and converted into very high order. I, that's all I can really give you, as, as really for working, basic working information. If you try to find other places in the universe where energy being stored is not giving off the radiation, the only way you really would know about it by, by sending off a, a signal such as radar and have to bounce off of something and come back to us. And they have to have some kind of information coming back with it to tell us it is a place where energy is being stored. And, we, and the, the radar, while it is really high speed, we just come to the next nearest star, it takes four and two thirty years for the light to get to us. The, the, the opportunity really to find one of these spots is, is really very recent we've had the radar and we haven't had time to really get anything coming back to us. But we are confronted, we, once you realize that there is this Bolt Boltzmann principle, which is then this, what I gave you, the importing, exporting that goes on. And Einstein's own observation that 
Well, as there, there is entropy, therefore an entropy characterizes every local system, and finding that energy is actually in quanta or finite packages, and this, there's no experimental evidence of what we call continuum. We have discontinuity, and you have finite energy packaging. Therefore, Einstein said, an aggregate of finites and finites for our universe, so non-unitarily conceptual, continually into transforming like a great scenario, it, we can assume it to be finite, because it is an aggregate of finites. Now, with, with, with this, this way of looking, looking at it, I, I, I want to then get to trying to, to answer you in the most powerful way. Einstein then said, I see that man, when, when I was young, when I came to Harvard University, the scholars were still assuming that the universe was a system. They were not as yet considering the experiment was made when I was five years old of, of the speed of light, and discovering that light did have a speed. And even after the measurement had made, it did not affect the scholars in general thinking about the significance of it. Einstein was the first to be really to think about it in an important way. At any rate, they were assuming when I came to Harvard University, the universe itself was a system. You didn't know the light had a speed. Therefore, they were assuming that universe is instant universe. The minute the clouds weren't there, night there, the stars are always there, and you get, you get them instantly. They're assuming then the universe was instant universe, a simultaneous universe. Therefore, they assumed it too was a system. Therefore, it too was losing energy, as every system is, and the universe was running down, as expression. And this is why the concept of the, uh, of the conservative of yesterday, anybody who then spent any energy was going to put the universe at everybody at a disadvantage a little more rapidly. So that Einstein then said, I think that here again, if then energies are, we, are, we do have a non-simultaneous universe, an aggregate of non-simultaneous events. Why does he say that? Well, take, just, I want you to look at, at, at the Big Dipper. In the handle of the Big Dipper, the second star in from the end of the handle, is you're seeing a live show taking place 100 years ago. And the next star on the handle is seeing a live show taking place 200 years ago. That's it. Just got it. Just like just got it. And if you look at, 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 uh, at Orion, you see some of the events taking place 1,500 years ago. And then let, let's look at the and, uh, Andromeda and this, this extraordinary little constellation you see glimmering there. You're seeing a live show being take, taking place 2 million years ago. Now, Einstein said, the universe is an aggregate of non-simultaneous events. And all of them are energy transformations and some of them may not be there anymore. So I said, I, I see then that the, an, an aggregate of non-simultaneous and only partially overlapping energy events is what is a, a description of a scenario. In contradistinction, a description of a single static frame picture. So he said, I see then on board of our little planet where a man has been assuming all this entropy, I see this little child doesn't get smaller, it gets bigger. I see that on board of our planet, energy apparently get accumulated. There's importing, and, then, and so all of the trees get bigger from the little, little spr sprout. So he said, I think it could be that when energy is then in a, in a non-simultaneous, only partially overlapping scenario universe, when energy is then disassociated here, they will, could be associating over there. So review of scientific experiments began to disclose, yes, you could account the energies. Now, there's something that does go on if you, if, if you are a scientist, and, and you get in, scientists often use the expression annihilation. But I'd like to, he does not really mean it the way you would tend to, to he, he uses a lot of words, he doesn't really mean that, because he is not a, really, he's not a semanticist or an etymologist. He, he wants to just get something out of his way. So he talks about particles when he said, I don't mean really a particle, there's no thing there at all, it's just an event. <laughs> but the point is, he used the word particle, and he used the word annihilation. Annihilation is, I wish you, there's only one rubber glove in the world, and it fits on my left hand here, and I'm stripping it off my left hand. It's red on the outside, as I begin to rotate it from on the bottom here, it's green on the inside. So I start pulling it off my hand, and it's, all of a sudden, finally, it's completely off my hand, and the left hand is gone. There's only a right hand now, and it fits my right hand. The left hand's been annihilated. If I pull it off my right hand, the right hand gets eliminated, and now we have the left. You can't have them both at the same time. And one is complementary to the other. We don't tend to then look at the complementation of our universe. Uh, you look at the form you do see, not really pay, uh, not looking at, at, the, at, the, at the negative of it, the omnidirectional negative of it. Anyway, 
the, the, the annihilation is really going out of tunability, observable tunability, conceptually definable, and then the universe which is finite but non-unitarily conceptual, if we're not non-unitarily definable. <laughs> And we do get then this fundamental recognition and re fundamental complementarity and so forth, where one doesn't explain the whole at all. No, there's no mono, mono, uh, monological explanation anymore. We don't look for it. Now, coming, I, I mainly, you, you've asked this question to try to sort of understand the way I'm talking, and, and I, I hope, have I answered you in any adequate way yet? I, I would like now to, to think, if making the working assumption that idea that we have a function in the universe <laughs> that, and that is syntropic and it's very, it's very high capability and I've described that to you all right. Now, if you were then designing an extraordinary universe where it does have all the degrees of freedom you, and you find the universe permits designing something like a daisy or design, designing a Betelgeuse, <laughs> a straight star. Some of them take longer and some shorter but most of them take quite a long time. But if you wanted then to have a local monitor on board of one of the little planets where energies are being collected, how would you, how would you get such a kind of capability that's going to be able to sense things so extraordinarily as we, we can sense? And would be able then to function with this beautiful mind. In this place, you're going to have to regenerate life and you're going to have to get something on board there that gradually develops itself. <laughs> because this is going to be a progressive assembly. So in order then to have biological life, because they're going to have to get, in order to have this, this human, human life there, being born naked, help, absolutely helpless, beautiful equipment, but no experience therefore absolute ignorant, then gradually by trial and error to find itself, gradually by trial and error to discover some principles. <laughs> there had to be then all kinds of support. So there had to be, you and I said, can't take the, radiation through our own skin to keep ourselves going. So the vegetation does do that for us. And we find that vegetation then, in order not to be dehydrated with all that exposure of, it, of its leaves, then has to have roots so it can be water cooled. By osmosis, take water out of the ground. And furthermore, by osmosis, osmotic valving can only go in one direction. So the, all the trees and vegetation putting enormous amounts of moisture in the sky again to come back as rain to keep the whole thing going. Beautiful design. The more you study it, the more fantastic it is. But having roots then, the vegetation can't get to the other vegetation to procreate. So the whole thing, the system would break down. We didn't find some way of developing cross-fertilization. So nature then invents all the insects and all the birds and the, all the worms to cross-traffic between the, the vegetations and to cross-pollinize, by which, which they then do get to regenerating. And we find then, in order to be able to get it at the then you get the honeybee is given the drive to go after his honey. That's all he goes after. And inadvertently, his little tail knocks off pollen, beautifully designed for it. He doesn't know, he's unconscious. And inadvertently, he's cross-pollinizing. So we have found all these creatures are given linear drives by virtue of which this inadvertently, at 90 degrees, they, they go on at this 100 degrees, at 90 degrees, they inadvertently take care of the circu circulatory system. And this is what man is discovering today. That's why you're all interested in the word ecology, which is to do with this great balance. But man was not interested yesterday. He was so full of his own drives. In order to get man to go, get as far as he does, you had to be sure you take on fuel, take on food, so you're made hungry. Stones are not hungry. It's quite a piece of design to make you hungry. Quite a piece of design to make you thirsty. And nature doesn't take chance on many of those being conscious, but she, so it doesn't even take a chance on your breathing, and your heart beating. Is that all taken care of? Most of you, 99.9% automated. And, and so we have a few things where I have choices by which of which we could make experiments and learn. So while every human, grown human, if it's available, will use a, take on about two pounds of solid food a day, five to six pounds of water, and takes in 54 pounds of, of, of atmosphere from which it extracts seven pounds of oxygen. The, the, the last one is the one you use the most of. The food, dry food, the least. But the dry food, you can go, men can go 30 days without dying. The water, only about a week. And, and the air, not more than two minutes. It's a completely different tolerance. In, in, and so, therefore, nature doesn't take any chance about that air. She has plenty of it around for you. And the air has been socialized for a long, long time. But 
because the food is something that you do need and then you have a hunger for it, yet you can get on for 30 days, you can learn something by that. And man then did, was given, really, I think, to get him, give him a drive for trial now to find out, it made him hungry and, and he had people who depended on him, he had innate love and, and looking out for us. So he began to find, I, my people are all hungry, there's no food around here. They've been great drought and, and they're dying. And, he, and he, I learned that there are a lot of people over the hill over there and they've got a beautiful green place for everything growing great. And, the, and you, you're, 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 you're starving, you're, your people are starving. So why don't we get together and go over and get in on this stuff? We, we have some very holy people, we're very devout people, and there's a very, we hear there's a very sinful people over there we ought to take away from them. The, the, the rationalization is very, so we have men developing war over their survival on the food basis. The, the water one, he gets mad fairly quickly. In the desert, he has really had great battles over oases and so forth, of water supply. But the air one, he was, that, that was socialized, he got plenty so he wouldn't get in trouble. Every once in a while, there is a fire in a theater, in a closed environment. And what happens with the fire is that the oxygen is immediately used up. That is fire. And very time and again, the building doesn't get burnt down, but you find the fire was over. Here you find a father who just loved his children to pieces, there his children, and it, within two minutes he went mad and he didn't realize it. He didn't ran over his own children. Killed his own children, just stampeding over them. So fine man then caught off balance and, 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 and killing, uh, taking life in any one of these instances, but when there was plenty around, he didn't, he really has been a very social creature about there. And so I find then, I just wanted to give you a way in which then nature gave him ways of a tolerance where he could learn something, yet it was vital. And that was in the food. Right. I will now then keep looking at this great design of man on board of our planet and the biological life being developed to, to where each one has a drive and man then in the beginning has all those drives and has a drive to procreate so he re, 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 reproduce himself enough times to finally get enough trial and error to really discover what he's really got. The kind of things I'm able really to talk to you about tonight, it's very extraordinary matter that we can talk this way. It's very extraordinary that there are those words that we can use as tools to communicate. It's very extraordinary there's literacy, because when I was young, literacy, general illiteracy was, was manifest. We were 90% illiterate. And we did have all the early history where there was just the great pharaoh and he's very tough and he's got a grand vision, the grand vision fixing out, and the, and the pharaoh said, boys, get out the whips and everybody's got to do what we say. Nobody's in on the thinking at all. Then you had a period when it spread a little more, a little more literacy, a little more information, and you get to it, the great, then there's at least a number of nobles, it's not just one, one king. And we get to a point where a little more information and begin to be the great middle class. And that's really right at Victorian, right up to, the, to this, this century. And I was born in that side, in that world. But suddenly, I, just in my own lifetime, completely new things come about where everybody is literate really around the whole world. It's an extraordinary matter. And everywhere around the world, everybody's being informed about the whole world. The, the information that is there, we totally, but suddenly 99% of humanity is suddenly coming into the problem of finding out what it's all about, where instead of then having great rulers who tell you what to do, or great political leaders who tell you what to do in, in, in the, in the uh, middle class era world, we're at a point where we are really suddenly finding out what it is all about, what needs to be done, and if you and I know that's what we, this, there's a leak over there and the ship is, you can see the water spouting, we don't need somebody to tell us go and stop that water, we got something to put in that hole. We just do it together spontaneously. So the kind of program I gave myself, looking around, what is it our experience teaches needs to be done? I see we wouldn't need anybody to tell us what to do if, if, if everybody's really in on the information. So we're really in the most extraordinary period now where, where we're going through all kinds of pushing, pulling of yesterday's residual ways of carrying on, residual orderings and, and man being pushed around a lot and, and, and the great bureaucracies of the great governments all assuming, all the ideologies are assuming there's fundamental scarcity. If you get into, and, and if you go into economics, you'll find the basic model in, in all economics is scarcity. That's the only model. And what do you do about scarcity? So all the great ideologies say, we don't know that you'd like our system, but we have the best way of coping with fundamental inadequacy. We have the best, fairest, most logical way. But, but this is not then a matter of thing. You have somebody who yesterday worked out something and then you have enormous allegiance to party and, and just get great religions and all dogma. And bureaucracy just doesn't think. So it goes along with what are the rules and I know my boss doing that way and I want my family to eat so I'm not going to get out of line. 
So I'm simply saying to you, we have all the great ideologies amassing for the last decade. The annual is about, of the United States, NATO, Russia, China, about 200 billion a year being appropriated. And got, how do you kill getting ready for Armageddon? It has to be you and me, it cannot be both. This is the story still. And now I've got enough information to discover it's highly feasible to take care of all of humanity. I understand living anybody ever known, but you have to really understand your principles. You have to get at really, it can only be done by, the, by all of humanity really getting themselves educated. I find an enormous amount of the Cold War that's going on when you're appropriating 200 billion a year on, on how you're going to destroy the other man. It's also quite obvious that you can anticipate, and if you can break down the other man's economy before you come to the war, it's going to be very much less expensive than waiting until you come to the hot war. So we have the Cold Wars, and waiting a little bit psychological. So there's enormous, uh, if you find it's not just CIA, but every one of the great powerful governments, enormous amount of trying to manipulate the other to get the other man discouraged. So enormous numbers of, of fairly easily digestible young people, uh, highly idealistic, very, very easy to get them off on, on wrong tracks, particularly as a kid does tend to copy what the older boy does, what the other old, old girl does. This is very logical uh, in the desire to understand and you, you hold it the one nearest your age, you can understand it a little better. So it's very easy to get these things going. So we have enormous cross-roughing, what evolution apparently is trying to do to get man going. But that's all very good and educational. It brings about all kinds of challenges, which are very important for us all to know. I think that we're, we're really going through a very powerful processing, an incredibly powerful educational processing. But and there's no question about it that here I'm being invited, average of I'm invited to greatly more, but I'm only able to accommodate about three such meetings I'm having with you tonight. I'm doing three of this a week, year in, year out. And, and there are 1,500, 2,000, 5,000 of young people coming all around the world. Everybody really wants to think, really find their way. It's a very beautiful, extraordinary kind of moment. You're so young, it's not very easy to get perspective to realize that it is a very new phenomenon. And that life is really, each child being born in the presence of a little more reliable information, very much less misinformation than yesterday. Every child spontaneously truthful then really latching onto this is what I smell, this is what I see. And realizing the older world is tied up with conditioned reflexes which they were given in order to make the whole thing. I said, come back to basic design, how to get this thing going. You would have to have all those linear drives. And but, but the, the, the total design, understanding the total, the total interchange, all, all the interrelationships of the, of the great big principles which you do discover. Anyway, see then we're coming from a point where you and I are then operating in the terms of conditioned reflexes of having somebody else tell us what to do and incidentally if you were then born and didn't ask to be big but you're good to be big another guy is quite strong so find a lot of little weak guys, guys over here physically saying mister we're very hungry won't you help us get that stuff over there so we can see the big man leading and he was asked to lead because he just simply was physically stronger so muscle is out there in the beginning obviously then if you were a strong, powerful, muscle guy and you find you're being asked to do all the fighting, you say, well, I can handle that big guy and that big guy, but don't let two of those big guys come at me at once. That's fairly simple, isn't it? What we call divide and conquer. Nothing good. In the physical world, divide and conquer is the very essence. And then if you were a, a conqueror, then the way you keep conquered is keep people divided. The number, all the great conquerors that came into India time and again came in from the north, but for a fairly simple reason. The more annual variation you have, the colder it gets, the more annual variation you have. And the more annual variation you have, the more kinds of environment you have to adjust to. So the people in the, in the thermal north have a different kind of challenge. If you lived in, in, by Lake Victoria in, in Africa, it's a very big lake and you might want to get to the other side. You learn a good reason to get over the other side. You find that wood floats. You can make it yourself a boat. <laughs> instead of trying to walk around over the root ends all around the edge of that lake. So you invent a boat. But in, if you were living by Lake Baikal in, in uh, eastern Af uh, Russia, you would invent a boat in the summer, but you invent sleds and, and skates in the winter. <laughs> Otherwise, the more annual variation there is, the more kind of invention. And this brought about the, the people to the thermal north developed more powerful tools and more weapons than the people to the, to the south. So that India was continually being invaded by people from the colder areas with, the, with the more tools and weapons. So once, once they, every conqueror that came into India 
found that there were a number of languages, there were a number of religions, so the Congress said, be sure that you've you got a great language, now you stick right to it, you've got a great language, you stick to yours, you've got a beautiful religion, you stick to yours. Kept everybody inherently divided. This is part of the game. That's why Russia, India was so highly governable and, and despite really great think, thinking brilliance. Okay, this is the way things have been up to now. But suddenly, we are all in the thinking. Now, I, I see then all of humanity pulling out where the young are saying, I just, I, I know my parents love me, it's as clear as it could be, they love me to pieces, I love them. But I see them preoccupied in, in, in short-sighted ways. That this is the way they were born and so forth. It's, it's, it's no stigma on the parents, the way evolution, his, history is simply accelerating that evolution, so there's a considerable perspective of that young world. So they seem to be preoccupied in ways that are so short-sighted the world is in trouble. And they are preoccupied in this way when they're not thinking about the side effects of what it is they're doing. And so they are polluting. They don't realize that we are on a spherical planet, not an infinite plane going to infinity where there's plenty of room to keep on polluting. So we have then a young world that's doing its own thinking and, and feeling, I've got to do something about it. It's now has enough information and, and it's spontaneously, it's beautiful. This mind phenomenon is absolutely non-quantitative. The physical is quantitative, but the, when you talk about the internal, you're talking about the non-quantitative. So intellect is something you turn on and you don't turn it on, but it, it's not a matter how intellectual you are. It's really, you use it and you don't use it. You really go along with the truth or not. You, you yield in fear to the other. So I find then that this younger world is, is building up enormous momentum. Each child is coming in. I'm getting letters from eight and 10 year olds, just magnificent in, in their, their way of looking at the whole challenge and that they find out that I'm somebody interested in that letter. They'd write me a letter halfway around the world. It's an extraordinary matter. These kids really know enough that there'd be somebody be interested in that letter. And they really give me the, the biggest way of looking at things, it's the most high sense of responsibility. So I, I'm, I really see humanity then breaking out. I'm going to give you a very powerful geometrical pattern. All these linear drives, like the, the roots of the tree going down in the ground, that's linear. And, and the tree leaves reaching out for the, for the vegetation. We have then, and, the, and then this honeybee goes in like that, driving in to the flower, wherever it is. There are all these, these linear drives that have been built in so the thing would get going. But what I talked about, these principles of embracing and so forth. I want to get a concept of the difference between spherically embracing and, and linear drives. Very interesting, you find, and I, I, first time I ever said this to some scientists, they said they didn't think this had ever been said before, and I, I guess maybe it hadn't. Anyway, I said, it's very interesting to note that radiation has shadow and gravity has none. Radiation has gravity, shadow because it is linear, <laughs> and, and the way child just automatically draws the sun with those rays coming off from it. But gravity is omni-embracing. If you want to think about a barrel, think about a barrel with the wooden staves in it. And the wooden staves are each in cross section a keystone, and their outer cord is greater than their inner cord. <laughs> Therefore, they can't fall in on each other, provided they're jammed up against each other. And what holds them together is then the embracing steel band, which is finite, because they are they are local and, and infinite. They otherwise they won't explode and come apart and they're kept from coming apart by the embracing. Gravity operates in this way, this embracing manner. And not just on a, on a single axis like a bow, but omni-embracing. Uh, and all these principles I've given you are omni-embracing. <laughs> Otherwise, they are circumferential versus radio. <laughs> I find everything a man up to now has been all radio. And he's been looking out then and said, if I'm not where that vegetation is growing, I'm, I'm going to starve because the food will rot. So I had to be near it. And he used to have to tend it. And he used to guard it very powerfully. So he built great city, the great city-state walls were built where he found vegetation. Very, very small part of the earth, only about 5% really immediately able to support life. And people have found it, often found that the place where they were gets flooded out or there's some other kind of catastrophe, drought, and they're trying to come invade these other people. And people built great walls. So humanity was guarding the local place where it could possibly survive because the vegetation had roots, so he put down roots. It's all changed. And then he began to discover ways in which he could use metals. The metals patterns are very different from the vegetation pattern. But by virtue of then finding tin and putting on his inside of a steel can, he could then hermetically seal and the food would not rot. And the food could reach people over there. So it didn't have to be near those roots. And, veg and then the refrigeration came through understanding his principles. But he began going after the metals. 
And the metals then said they were mines and people then began to guard those mines and the whole survival seemed to depend on that. So we have men locally, you can understand it, really guarding property and having a property sense, that's the only way it's going to survive. Okay? Then we began to learn that every time we, this, for instance, the coppers, we took it out of the ground. I'm just, it's, it's, it is, of all the metals, it is, of, of, and plentiful metals, it is the best conductor of energy, electromagnetic energy. Gold is better, but it's not enough of it to be used that way. The silver is a little better, it's not enough of it, but there's plenty of the copper to use it that way as long as you use it economically. Now the copper, our first telephone wire, one cross section, we could just get one message from here to there with it. It was about 10 years later, beyond found you could get two messages over the same cross section. <laughs> then man learned how he got 12 over the same cross section, then he got up to 28, then he got up to 200, then he got up to over 2,000, then he went wireless. <laughs> but every time we melted up the metal, it began to get taken care of more people with the same amount of metal. <laughs> As our experience, we're always learning more, and, and every time we melt up, then we can put a little higher, take care of a little more people, a little higher service with, with the same amount of metals when we re reform it. And right, the telephone company chief engineer in 1930, Bell Labs, said, apparently, we do so much more with so much less each time we melt it up and reuse it. They said we could go on to expand the telephone service as it existed in the United States in 1930 to the whole world without mining or buying another pound of copper and said in fact that the telephone company would be copper sellers throughout that and that's turned out to be correct. We're now at a point where one communication satellite weighing a quarter of a ton is out outperforming the transoceanic communication capability of 175,000 tons of copper cable, one quarter ton, gets 175,000 tons. Let's get a little idea of them. What really has happened then, man started then taking these metals out of the ground he began to really, he, he mentioned, he sort of thought this is permanent, not realizing it's going to be made obsolete by a more important invention. There was, I can tell you from the total of all the inventings and all the industrializings, it's about 22 and a half years of a generation in which all the metals stay in, it and, in a given function before they get metaled out and be re reused again. Some of them happens very much faster, some a little slower, but the average is 22 and a half years. Now I can really tell you something, it was only just beginning to, it became evident in the 1930s, we began to really study big patterns, but it's only beginning to be known now in, in any kind of general economic way. The metals that we've now mined, as they get recirculated, we, in the meantime we've learned so much more about so much higher performance, I can tell you it's feasible now with the metals that have now been mined and the knowledge we now have, that every, just recirculate what we have, we don't have to mine anymore. That's exactly what Japan learned. Because they don't have any mines, they learn how to get on with recirculating. And they completely take the same amount of metal, giving you two automobiles for one. What I'm getting at here then is that we used to have to be near the roots to, to, to be able to survive, to guard them. You don't have to be there anymore, the food can reach you anywhere. You used to have to guard the mines, you don't have to guard anymore. What's going on is recirculating. The big thing now is the conservation of, of knowledge itself. So every time you, you, we make an experiment, we always learn more, it's irreversible, you can't learn less. You can only learn more. Sir? Sir? Would, would you tell me what it is? Would you tell me what it is? What did you mean by that? He wants, what, he wants to know what you mean by science being synogenic. I, I gave you synergy. Did you understand what I gave about behavior between and not of? Were you in the room when I gave you about this? You took what the mass of this one is, mass of that. But then there was nothing in the characteristic. Don't talk to me. Listen to me. No man, you, you wanted to get to get to get some information. I said then, there is nothing in the characteristic of moon or earth or any of the inner mass attracted behavior that said that if you have the distance between, they're going to increase the attraction second power. The, there's nothing in the between behavior, the relationship that's predicted by any of the powers taken by themselves. This is what I call synergy. I said all the scientific principles are really always relationships between and not ours. So I said all the scientific principles are synergetic.
Is there an alternative to synergy? Uh, if you can invent another universe, because if I look for the powerful generalizations, there are generalizations of generalizations. That is, tension and compression always and only coexist. That is a generalization. But they can be embraced by the Poisson law, can be embraced by precession. The, listen, listen, if you ask me a question, let, wait for me to answer you. Please. You, I said, the most powerful single generalization I know that embraces other generalizations is synergy. If you can find another universe, we can maybe get on without it, but it seems, it, this, it seems to be manifest. That's all I can say. It seems to be that's the evidence. Very good. We, are very, we, are to take, we have taken a lot of time. I wanted to get to the point where I was showing you a transition in principle. I've got you then going where these things are circulating now instead of being linear, where you have to protect them by owning. Where it's a matter of knowledge of how you use, rather than what, what is just the original effort to pro, or the first way you designed it. And there are these relative efficiencies of design where our reciprocating engine is only 15% efficient and turbine is 30 and, and fuel cell is 85% efficient. So if you use a more efficient, which are available, we're not using, then you begin to be able to take care of more and more. Anyway, I would say to you that what I think is going on in the pattern is that we're going then from, from the linear plug-in to, to circumferential. That's why you're here with me, that we are really talking about the circumferential, that this is, is, a, is a new pattern. So man apparently is breaking, coming out of a womb of permitted ignorance, where you get him going, where he had to be on the umbilical cord, <laughs> had to be being taken care of by what the honeybee does absolutely directly and so forth, to really begin to understand the principles themselves. So I think that, that this is a very great transition from just being, being plugged in to, to, being, uh, to beginning to understand, that's what we're talking about, comprehending, what is comprehend. All, all, so I, my, my, my total summation is that Please understand that this is, I'm just giving you my, 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 my exploration and my working hypothesis and so forth. I'm not really asking you to, to, to hold on, but, but I think you could, be, you could at least might be probably interested because you've come to ask me to come talk to you, that I have been able to find a way in which I can, I can explain and can explore. And often working hypothesis is very worthwhile, even though it may turn out to be too crude and something else is happening, but it does help you to open your eyes and you really learn how to speculate. At least I've been speculating in, in an orderly manner. <laughs> and I, I, in other words, I've been trying to think out loud with you tonight in the terms of the experience I have and let the order of the experience begin to disclose itself. Yes, sir. Why, why is the transition from linear to the being made now? Why did it happen 500 years ago or why did it happen years ago? I would think, see, we have then something called gestation rate. <laughs> And things don't happen, the earliest you could see that could happen at all. <laughs> I point out to you, all scientists still seeing the sun going down, though, though everybody's, everybody's known for 500 years the sun is not going down. <laughs> so I find our reflex is a very powerful conditional man. And I would think that what's going on in the present time in this birth of all that's coming out of common womb is one really of, of enormous education. And, and, and I, what I used to despair of when I was young of many problems being solved that I could see, my experience took me across all the different tracks and I said, these people over here will never understand what's going on over there. But gradually all the things I didn't think would get out in the open have all gone down in the open. And the, really, the, in a sense, the very messiness of the news today, where the news tends to, is a very strange matter because this must be very deep in man for the moment. The, all the newspapers, for instance, in the, in the free press around the world can only keep going on advertising. That pays for it. And advertising in direct proportion to the lineage. And the newspaper publishers around the world want to know what gives them the greatest lineage. So every one of them made surveys, and many of them, to great dismay, discovered that what sells best is bad news. That apparently what, and so the newspapers are getting out good news and trying to really, they've gone out of business. And so we just, we're really being all found with seemingly bad news. But I think this is really evolution getting, the real problem is really out there. Many of them have misstated, I'm, I'm, no question about it. But the point is, everybody's out, they were chewing on these things. So I, I, I would say it's inevitable that we really are in a state of very great consideration of the, of the significance and, and, and what the total inventory is. I say, all of you have been hooked on, on yesterday's specialization because in order to keep them conquered, I said, you keep specialized. 
And you have then the great conqueror saying, I'm the only one who has the, what do you call the great intelligence that went to the head man. You just mind your business, you understand? And you mind your business and, and, and I'll put things together for you and you do what I tell you. And, and so all the specialization in our education really sprung from this being the grand strategy of the power man. Where he was terribly scared of the intellectuals and made them all specialists. And when he really scared of them, he said, I'm going to give you tenure. So you really stay put. I get you, I, and you're really too clever, so I'm going to give you a Nobel Prize. You can stay pure now. Just give me the eggs. I'll tell you what to do with the eggs. So th this is where we were been really hooked in. So what I what I am what I'm exposing to is the way I, I found I really had to deal comprehensively, and it is possible to get very important information to go in depth. But the way to get on is not then to learn all the special case information which most of the specializations are doing, but to learn your generalized principles. They got to hold true in every case. If you get to know your generalized principle, you really can go in depth in, in, in one direction after another. And I was able to really prove that when I was what called science and technology advisor to, to Fortune magazine in, in the late 30s, 1938 to 40, where we would do one great corporation after another. And I was brought on there to, to, to emphasize the scientific background of these great, great industries. And when I went to, the, as other editors and researchers went to talk with the sales manager and people are making all the money, but I would have to go and meet the vice president in charge of research and development, the chief engineers. And they say, it's impossible for you to tell a fortune reader what it is we're dealing in the depth because it can only be expressed mathematically. And, and, and fortune readers don't read the mathematics. I was able at the end of, the, uh, of the one month, in every case, to complete satisfaction of those scientists to tell the fortune readers what was going on, not in the mathematical terms, but in terms of principle the way I've been giving to you, without going to blackboard. And, and they said, we didn't think you'd be done, but you, you have done it. In other words, I have found these bridges can be made, and by, but it's by understanding my generalized principles. So I really have had the great fortune of knowing some very great scientists and, and finding that they, they say that they're really surprised, but I'm able really to talk about what they're interested in depth. I seem to be able to get there in, in relatively a few minutes. Because I said, the whole strategy is to understand your generalized principles. That's, that's fairly simple. And, 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 and I'm quite confident every human being can, can get into this way and, and can, can so say, I can go, I've at times in order to do the kind of work I do, I've spent an enormous amount of time just in this mathematics or just this structure, but it, I've still had plenty of time to get the rest of it and to integrate it with the, with the whole. I think we've really had, 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 had a long enough evening, but I, I'm going to say to you that the information where I, I'll get into, for instance, then, doing more with less, which was part of the, of the great challenge. How do you do so well with what you have by using the highest performance capabilities? You are able to take care of everybody, by which of which then I saw this only way we'd ever do away with war. As long as somebody's going to die through inadequacy, somebody's going to get up and fight. But if you really do make enough to go around, then you don't have to have the war, which came clear to me about the air. So I began to say, what do we need then for environment controls? I, I'm sure that. I'd be terribly surprised, if even, even if they've known this question and been asked many times, if anybody in this room is going to tell me where this building weighs. I'd be surprised if anybody tell me where this building weighs within 100,000 tons. I'd be surprised if any of this room, anybody in this room were telling me what any building weighs anywhere. <laughs> and I, I've tried this with architects, and, and, and when they ask me to come speak to them, they just don't have an answer. It's not in the language of building, yet everybody knows what the Boeing 747 weighs, you know, what the Queen Mary weighs, whatever it may be. You know exactly what you get out of every ounce invested. So a building was why? Because it used to be this big for the fortress. Bigger and heavier and higher the walls, the better. That's the way that's been thought about. But on the sea, you had to, you want to be doing more with less. You had to float, you had to stay on top of the, the water, not go to the bottom. Had very little floatability, what are you going to invest it in? So we learned how to get high and high performance in the sky and on, on the water, in electronics, but on the land, no. I now, I now know experimentally by by getting into, first very simple thing, spheres enclose the most volume of the least surface. Flat sheet is very structurally unstable. Get it into, into a cylinder and it has, it has column strength. But I get into compound curvature, which is concave on one side, concave on the other. It, this has to involve triangulation and you get the greatest strength. Compound curvature has the greatest strength. So I said, I've got to get into compound curvature, I've got to get into give, give me the most. That's what's brought me into sphericity. Then you have to get into omnitriangulation. And I can say then, these geodesic structures are enclosing clear span space for a given earthquake loading, given hurricane loading, for all the important loadings and all the tasks. I can, I can tell you from the ones that have been built, the large ones, 
and they had to be overbuilt to satisfy building departments and ignorance of man in general. That they are, the ones that have been built, are, I'm enclosing clear span, doing all these things, all the performance, for only 3% of the weight of material necessary to do the same task by other known engineering strategies than omnitriangle latest spheres. I can tell you that the new generation of geodesics that are coming up now are going to give you 200 buildings for one. And I really have gone into what was going on with our process and so forth. And finally, we don't have to keep taking all the water and using 50 volumes of water to get rid of one volume of waste and so forth. And it's not waste at all. It's very valuable chemistry, very necessary. Nature hasn't any pollution. All the chemistry is absolutely essential to the regeneration of the universe. And you and I just are not familiar with it, so we call it pollution. And, and we, we let it get diffused instead of keeping it concentrated and highly ready to be used. So I find we're doing many very ignorant things. And when I get into what I find is actually highly feasible, the, I can simply say to you that I, I now know it is highly feasible with the information we now have, resources we now have, take care of all of humanity, the highest standard living anybody's ever known, and do it by 1985. I know that. And, and nothing can shake me down there. I've got an experiment. I know what I'm talking about. Therefore, I say, all the, all the ideology is obsolete, utterly obsolete. We're always absolutely obsolete. <laughs> so, let, let's stop. <laughs> I, I, want to, uh, I want to thank you. <laughs> I, I, please. You've heard what I talked about where there's a f the effect of a body in motion on another body in motion is precessional. And the effect is not the way you and I tend to think. You tend to think, if I pull on you, you're going to yield towards me, or I'm going to push you, you're going to go away. The effect of bodies in motion on other bodies in motion precessional is, for instance, the pull of the sun on the earth makes it go into orbit, 90 degrees. We've all been thinking absolutely linear and that you push and pull. That, that is not the fact. Every, what we do to each other, we make each other go in orbit around each other. I'm saying then to you, when you start clapping and, 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 and saying to me, you, you like what's going on, I don't take this personally at all. You're saying to each other, it is true. That's what you're saying. That's what I think. Mr. Fuller? Mr. Fuller, I have one, one last question. What do you think of the energy crisis that's going on? Let, 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 let me answer you about questions. I have, very frequently, I get telephone call at two in the morning. I don't know how they know how I am, but people say, I'm calling you long distance, that warrants my calling you at two in the morning. They say, I want to ask you a question. I'm an inventor and I'd like to ask, you're an inventor, you, you help me. I say, well, the first thing that I really learned, uh, you apparently are calling me because you think I have some answer. I'll tell you that if, if it's worth anything to you at all, and the first thing I learned to do was not to ask anybody any questions, go and find out for myself. So if you want me to help you, I'm going to ring up, uh, hang up. If you don't want me to help me, uh, if you don't want me to help you, just keep on talking. A lot of people just want to make a speech. At any rate, if they keep on talking, then I hang up. Thank you. <laughs>